good afternoon all welcome to the pic lecture series on reinventing india since we launched this lecture series on 3rd of january 2012 we have had the honor of luminaries like former president dr kalam honorable minister virappa moili ji honorable minister sushil kumar shinde ji dr rajendra pachauri and mr pratap bhanu mehta among others the honor it is to have Union Finance Minister among us to address this August gathering today. Shri Rahul Bajaj, Dr. Vijay Kelka, Dr. Dilip Padgaonka, members of the Pune International Centre, distinguished guests, students from Symbiosis Institution, and the subject is how do we convert. these challenges as opportunities drawing from our experience of india's liberalization since the story began in 1991 the first lesson that i learned was that no reform and i mean that no reform has been pushed in india without opposition i can't think of a single policy pronouncement that has been accepted without opposition going back over the last 21 years there are a number of examples that i can give of how a severe challenge to the indian economy was converted into an opportunity and we made a paradigm change or a fundamental change or a transformational change regarding that subject in fact there are examples even pre liberalization in the 1960s and early 1970s when we lived from what was called ship to mouth when we imported wheat under public law 480 and ship loads of wheat disgorged millions of tons of wheat in our ports which were taken directly to the ration shops that was converted into an opportunity by a far sighted statesman to usher in the green revolution since liberalization of course there are numerous examples in 1991 there was a time when our reserves had dwindled to less than 15 days import just before the new government had assumed office several tons of gold had been pledged with the bank of england the nation was in shock but that situation of shock and a deep sense of shame was converted into an opportunity and we could devalue the rupee not once twice in a matter of 48 hours relax controls on foreign exchange amend the foreign exchange regulation act remove whole chapters from the monopolies and restrictive trade practices act and as a result within a year the currency reserves which were less than a billion dollars recovered and rose to 6.4 billion dollars economic growth revived from 1.2% to a little over 4% but for the severity of the economic challenge of 1991-92 i doubt whether fera would have been repealed or mrtpc would have been slashed or whether a number of other ancillary laws would have been changed another example of a challenge that was converted into an opportunity was the opening up of the services sector historically most countries have gone through this 
phase of growth. Agriculture, then you move into industry, and then you move into the services sector. A service sector driven economy was considered the third stage of development. What happened in India was rather different. In 1991, the shares of the three sectors were agriculture, 29.6, industry, 27.7, and the services sector, 42.7. In the last 21 years, the share of industry has remained more or less constant. 27.7, as I said, in 1991, 27.4 in 2002, and 27 in 2011-12. The share of industry has remained constant at 27. The transformation came because agriculture shrunk from 29.6 in 1991 to 20 in 2002 and to 14% in 2011 12. It shrunk by almost 15%, and that 15% has been added to services, which rose from 42% to now 59%. It is true that information technology has led the growth in the services sector. But there are many other parts of the services sector where similar growth has occurred because of this aspirational middle class who wanted their boys and girls, their children, to have service sector jobs rather than jobs on the plant floor. It has its downsides. We are not as big a manufacturing country as we should be, and we still import a lot of capital goods and a lot of machinery, but it has led to more or less a, a jump over one level of development into a service sector-led economy. As all of you know, we did not make any big bang reforms. Our reforms were gradual. Everything that we do is gradual. Even the currency controls were removed in a gradual manner. I think gradualism is paid off. We have not had major displacements of population like has happened in China. We've not had any surge in the migration from rural India to urban India, although urban India still suffers from many malaises. A surge in migration would have made the position worse. I think gradualism is generally paid off. Now, what are the challenges today which can be converted into opportunities? Let me give you a couple of examples. The first example is the subsidy burden. It's a huge burden. Petroleum, food, fertilizers. Even if some part of them are merit subsidies, they have ballooned over the years. And the reasons are quite evident. On petroleum, we have no control. The prices are fixed by the producing countries. On food, again, we have to pay our farmers more every year. There is no country in the world which will produce the food that India requires. In order to protect the poor, you have to subsidize food, and that subsidy also balloons from year to year. The same thing in fertilizers. We do not have the raw material for certain fertilizers. We have to import those fertilizers. If you pass on the entire price to the farmer, then the procurement price will increase. Whether it's a subsidy on the input or a subsidy on the output, the subsidy is a subsidy, and that bill has also risen from year to year. There are many other subsidies a number of subsidies which are clearly non-merit subsidies. Subsidizing a diesel SUV is a clearly a non-merit subsidy. But we don't seem to have found a way in which we can subsidize diesel for some and not subsidize diesel for other consumers because that will only lead to a black market. 
So there are problems in administering the subsidy. So the subsidy burden has reached a point today and we are on the threshold of converting this challenge into an opportunity. That is the cash transfer. Even until a year ago, cash transfer was blasphemy. Nevertheless, the nation seems to be prepared, mentally prepared to accept cash transfers. Beginning 1st of January, in 51 districts spread over 16 states, we will transfer all government payments, all subsidies, progressively through an Aadhaar-enabled bank account to the beneficiary. The fact that the subsidy bill has become so big and it has become such a challenge to the economy is giving us an opportunity to make a transformational change in the manner in which we deliver subsidies. The pilots that we are running have thrown up such revealing results. Thousands of ration cards have been found to be bogus. Once we have a biometric embedded Aadhaar enabled bank account, the chances of duplication and falsification are reduced to near zero. Let me give you another example of a challenge which can be converted into an opportunity. Take the current account deficit. Now this is different from the fiscal deficit. The fiscal deficit is the overall borrowing of the government. The current account deficit is uh, export minus import, net of invisibles. The current account deficit in the current fiscal is expected to be $70 billion. Now the $70 billion has to be paid for in hard currency. You cannot pay for it in rupees. Now we'll have to find $70 billion. Tell me, how do you find $70 billion? If I don't find $70 billion, then we'll have to run down our reserves. Our reserves are only $290 billion. You can run it down one year, you can run it down a second year, but after that what? So as long as we have a current account deficit, exports minus imports, net of invisibles, running at $70 billion, FDI is not an option. FDI is an imperative. The question is, how do we get the foreign investment? There are only three heads under which you can bring in foreign money. One is FDI, foreign direct investment. The second is FII, foreign institutional investment. And the third is ECB, external commercial borrowing. There's no other way. If you take money from World Bank, it is external commercial borrowing. If you take money from Asian Development Bank, it's external commercial borrowing. If you take concessional loans from a friendly country, that is also external commercial borrowing. So there's no other head except FDI, FII and ECB. Therefore we rank FDI in the hierarchy of foreign money, we rank FDI as the highest. Then we rank FII next and we rank ECB third. Because ECB creates debt. Therefore, this current account deficit today gives us an opportunity to tell the people that we need foreign investment in this country. Our own savings can be invested here, but our own savings are not enough. We need an additional $70 billion, and we need to tap into the savings of another country, which means look at the huge opportunities it creates for reforming several sectors of the economy. Firstly, you open up new sectors for foreign investment because that is an imperative. Secondly, you must have a stable polity in this country, otherwise nobody will invest. You must have stable policies, especially tax policies. You will have to reform your visa policies. You will have to improve connectivity with other countries. You will have to make customs and immigration friendlier to people who visit India. So I think the mere fact that today a ballooning current account deficit is a huge challenge, but I think it throws up opportunities to reform many sectors of the economy. There are a number of such examples. Every challenge 
can be converted into an opportunity. In fact, every challenge must be converted into an opportunity. Willy-nilly, we will be the third largest economy in the world in the next 15 to 20 years. In the next 15, 20 years, we cannot be a large and per capita rich country. That's not possible because our population is very large. But there are two parts. One is we will be the third largest economy in terms of GDP, either in nominal terms or in PPP terms. But we can be a third largest economy, but in per capita terms, a poor country. Or we can be a large, a third largest economy, but in per capita terms, a middle income country. It is a path that we take that will decide where our destination is. I think the choice is obvious. The goal is attainable. It requires unity, unity of purpose, not agreement on everything, but an ability to build consensus, ability to give and take. We can fight each other, we can oppose each other, we can argue against each other, but at the end of the day, we must do what the cardinals do in Rome. At the end of the day, we must come out with white smoke from the chimney. I sincerely hope that when India becomes the third largest economy in the world, it will be a large economy, but in per capita terms, it is a middle-income country. Thank you.